All right, guys, welcome back to the monthly cup. We have the semi-final game ready for you guys. Uh, this is the last four contenders for the monthly cup, ready to duke it out. We have veterans versus up-and-comers. In the other semi-final, we have Masaka versus Alva, whereas we have Mr. T going up against Lou90. Now, you have some interesting stats about our up-and-comers. Yeah, I mean, this is really like mirrors on on both semifinals here. So, of course, Lou and Alvar, we've talked uh, about, uh, the, you know, their records in the past few months of how consistent they have been. Uh, Lou specifically, but of course, Alvar, you know, they've matched up against each other, really. Both of them coming from the third place match last month. Mr. T and Masaka both played in last month's uh, monthly cup and lost in the opening round. And then now both uh, playing in their second monthly cup, advancing all the way to the semifinals here. So it's funny that we have, uh, you know, the, the veteran on one side who has played against the veteran on the other side and now both facing off against the, the newcomers to the scene. You know, it could work out quite funny in a way if Lou and Alva were to lose and face <laughs> each other again in the third place match but Mr. T and Masako who went at round one to get into the last round of this cup so there'd be some interesting symmetries and stuff going on uh, if things line up but I'm pretty sure Lou will not go down without a fight same with Alva both hungry for a monthly cup title yeah, they definitely want to both end off on uh, on a winning note here. Uh, of course, Alvar would be looking to win another monthly cup after winning before. But, uh, you know, it's also a situation where if Alvar advances and then loses, he will complete his own top four. Uh, he has a first, a third, and a fourth place to his record. Just needs that second, but really not the way you want to go out losing just to complete that. Hey, he'd be the only player who'd done it. Maybe that would be worthwhile enough to take that second place. But first, yeah. he needs to get there. Let's see if he can. But in our game, Mr. T going up against Lou90, the experienced versus the up-and-comer. Who is going to come out on top? And we'll get these players ready now, and we'll get into that match. Now, we know Lou is starting out with the green-yellow sacrifice, whereas Mr. T is a bit more of a mystery unless you spotted anything on the other stream. Yeah, I, I briefly tuned in uh, to the other to I believe it was Don Pork Stream was watching uh, Mr. T versus Teddy, and I tuned in to see what the score was. Didn't even think to actually look at the decks, but uh, seeing the Soul Eaters there, we're going to see a green yellow sack mirror to start off here, since we already know that's what Lou's running as his opening deck. Yeah, Green Elf Sacrifice been very strong in this tournament so far. Uh, maybe in anticipation to count a rush. We've had a few rush players do really well. Lizard, you know, 3-0 his first uh, two matches with Yellow Rush. Uh, but now a Green Yellow Sack Mirror. I'm curious to see how this plays out. Mr. T going for the Tiki Caretaker variant and having those Sky Axe earlier, which can be absolutely crucial to winning this game. Yeah, the... Uh kind of annoying part of the sky axe in this matchup is you don't have a lot of fighting going on early you don't have a lot of reach clears uh so you're not going to see something like a soul drain or a cypher's wrath clear off an early sky axe and then you reinforce with the double yak behind it uh in this type of situation it is you're going to be looking for your own sacrifice tool rather than basically relying on your opponent to clear it for you yeah and it can it's interesting because this, this matchup can come down to how the cards line up. So if, say, say one player manages to accelerate Yaks very quickly, that could be a good win condition because it's very hard for Green Yellow Sack to, like, AoE clear. They don't have access to that. But on the other hand, a Soul Eater, an early Soul Eater, after a lot of, lots of Sacks could be really good. But then again, a Shaitan Assassin could stop a Soul Eater in its tracks. So very, very interesting matchup. Yeah, I don't believe that we would see anything like the the last nightmares as removal. Generally, in more control matchups, you would go, okay, there's three soul leaders, there's three last nightmares. I know I have to save those specifically for the counter to that card. In this type of a matchup, we saw the assassins earlier from Lou's list, so those will definitely be the cards that you want to have down when the the soul leaders are uh, potentially going to be played. Going for that Iona Smile finds another Sky Axe. So we're actually even on Sky Axe right now. The only difference is the Flash Salmons are in Lou's hand, which gives him some, some reach when it comes to removal. We're going to sack this first Sky Axe in order to play two more to surround his Demon Wing 
and you know, protect it from this other Skyax. Skyax everywhere, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we do see the assassin come out for Mr. T, so it will be similar strategies from both players. Uh, always really nice when you can get your Skyak to die first, then you have two, and your opponent's always playing catch up from there, essentially. But uh, this does line up really nicely for Mr. T to trade a Skyak rather than using it as a, a sacrifice and not getting that actual um, combat value out of it. But then your follow-up is, you know, the, the two Skyaks coming down, maybe you use a Shaitan Assassin or you go for the Tiki Caretaker for the buff. But uh, right now it's a little awkward for what your follow-up is because something like a Bone Collector would accelerate this game in an incredible fashion. I'm curious of if it's better to go for the caretaker here and um, you know force another creature into the sky act, get a bit of value out of it and then go for double sky act after it's it's kind of awkward i think but i, I kind of feel that like the caretaker is a little better for two reasons because one you get more out of your sky act but two you also set up a collector on the right hand side which could be very important to match the fairy generation that's going to come from that demon wrangler i feel like i would if that's the line you're going to go for i feel like i would prefer the trade and then double Skyak, and then, power and then buff one of those. Ah. Um, I think that possibly lines up a little... Well, it's still going to die to the Demon Wing, so maybe it trades almost exactly the same way, but if you went for the Caretaker to keep your first Skyak alive, then you wouldn't have a follow-up here. You'd have possibly the Caretaker coming down onto the right like you were talking about, but then there's nothing else, because you don't want to play that other Skyak without it being a double. And this is kind of why I like the Caretaker line on the Sky App preemptively, because you force a trade off anyway, and then you can get a bit of collection on the right hand side, and then next turn you go into your Sky Axe, while when Lou has potentially lost all of his, and maybe regained some momentum on the left hand side. But this matchup is it's really funny, like how to figure out how to win and like where to go from there. It's I think every play is gonna matter because I think it's difficult to assess who's ahead, especially in board states like this. It's, yeah, this type of matchup's interesting because there are quite a few matchups where you almost want to be the second mover. Um, something like a red versus red matchup, you always want to be the second ground shaker because then yours deals the one damage that then allows you to clear their ground shaker. In this type of a matchup, you actually want to be first. You want to have your Sky Yak down so that you can then have your uh, combo Sky Yaks down before your opponent. You want your Assassin down before their Soul Leaders come down. Uh, you want your Soul Leader down possibly before their Soul Leader comes down. So it's it's very much a momentum based. You want to get your creature down, your setup down before your opponent does. It's interesting right now because both players have a Soul Eater and both players have an Assassin. So they <laughs> they both have the win condition, but they also both have the answer as well in hand. So I think these players are going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe for quite some time. And it might be, you know, the micro movements or the micro plays that really make the difference in this matchup. Yeah, we see the Fnatic come down fairly passive play coming out from Mr. T, but doesn't really have anything better you can go for. Of course, this is a deck like we've talked about throughout the course of the day that you really can't go for early draws to try to find something better just to, to have a creature on the board. You really need to develop a land every single turn to get towards your soul leaders as fast as possible, especially in the current meta where this type of a deck really doesn't run any land ramp. You're not going to be running things like Wood Elemental and it's kind of few and far between when we see an Earthcraft in these types of decks. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes it does crop up, sometimes it doesn't. And to be fair, an Earthcraft in the mirror is actually really relevant because it pushes you one land above your opponent, which allows you to enable your Soul Eaters quicker and, you know, you'll be the one with the initiative uh, with those cards. But so far, not, neither player has drawn one, so we can assume they either don't have them or they're not going to be relevant because... You know, Lou going up to five lands now, and then Mr. T is going to follow up with his fifth land, and then we'll see what Lou does after. You know, just using these flash damage to cycle, but they also empower the Soul Eater, which is going to be very important. Yeah, and, and that cycle is something that we also talk about a lot in this type of a matchup, that maybe you don't need Earthcraft because of that. Uh, you have things like the, the Flash Salmon now gives you a lot of access to Cycle as well as buffing your Bone Collectors or potentially Clears depending on the way that you choose to use it. And then you also have... Um, 
uh, the village elder is the other one that gives you that cycle as well. So maybe sometimes with the Earthcraft, you're just drawing cards uh, as much as possible if you choose to use that. But a lot of times we just don't see players going for it uh, to get ahead in that type of situation. What do, what do you think about Flash Salmon and then Caretaker the Flash Salmon so it survives the clear on the uh, the Wrangler so it cycles? Is that a waste? I actually of a tech really caretaker? like it. No, I'm I'm trying to think of what your best caretaker is in this type of a matchup. Your Wind Soldiers probably clear really nicely. Your Caretaker buffing something like the Assassin in hand. Uh, it goes to a 3-3, three, three, which means something like a Wind Soldier or even just the Fanatic is going to clear it really nicely. I really don't mind the Caretaker buff uh, to the Salmon here because it still gets you that cycle. I just don't know if you actually need this cycle right now. No, it's probably still good enough to go for it because you're going to collect. You potentially set up for double Solier if you draw into it next turn. That's what I was thinking as well. You set the Harvester, uh, you kill the Wrangler, you dig deeper into your deck, and then you could potentially find either more Soul Eaters to apply pressure, maybe more Assassins to relieve pressure, or other cards that you're kind of aiming for as you draw deeper into the deck. Now, Lou is ahead when it comes to lands. You know, Soul Eater can come down this turn, but the... No, the demon, uh, the Shaitan assassin, sorry, is definitely a threat. And you can see the Soul Eater being developed on the left-hand side, way out of range of it. <laughs> Doesn't want to go anywhere near it with the Soul Eater. Yeah, and that's like what uh, we were talking about earlier, of getting that first uh, assassin down before the Soul Eater comes down. Lou, very smartly, he's going to play some creatures as fodder over onto the far side and deal with that assassin and then have the Soul Eater as the, the big threat on the far side. 8-8 eight, eight is really uh, big right now for Mr. T to try to deal with. His Soul Eater, only a 5-5. Five, five. So, Lou, that extra little bit ahead in terms of board and the actual state of your win condition. And I think Lou is in a good spot to react to Mr. T Soul Eater by playing the Assassin on the correct side. So, say for example, if Soul Eater was to come down on the right now, Lou now has a more aggressive desert, which he can use then to play his soul, uh, his assassin in range of the Soul Eater. So, very, very, very good being first in this mirror. <laughs> yes, it is. And this is a situation now, Lou looks like he has really good clears lined up into the Soul Eater, and then he's able to possibly set up an assassin of his own. His Soul Eater is also going to control the left side of the board with the charge. It's going to be able to come all the way down and not only threaten possibly hitting the orb next turn, but just threaten these creatures as well. This is looking really solid position for Lou. And Double Wind Soldier as well can just completely eliminate this assassin if he doesn't want to use the creatures on board. Uh, the Demon Wrangler is quite expendable here, I think. But on the other hand, if you want to sack something for your own Shaitan Assassin, Demon Wrangler might be the perfect target for that. I'm, I'm curious to see how he manages the enemy assassin, and then if he develops his own assassin to counter that Soul Eater. Yeah, I mean, this Demon Wrangler is going to pick up full value here. It costs you two to play. It's basically going to be similar to like a Falcon Dive to clear off the protection bubble of the Shaitan Assassin. It's given you a 5-2 as well as two uh, plus one one buffs onto your Soul Eater late game. Super strong value out of this uh, this little Demon Wrangler. I'm going to use the Wind Soldier in combination with the little Demon Wrangler. Now, are we going to... Oh, this is so smart. Just take care of the Soul Eater with Wind Soldiers while it's more manageable, powering up his own Soul Eater to a 10-10. Now, the Assassin is still dangerous with a Fnatic. I think you... Uh, I guess it doesn't really matter which way you did it. I was going to say you could have actually gone for clearing the Assassin and the Bone Collector would have gone up to a 3-5, still would have contested clearing the 6-3 of the um, Soul Leader there, but it still just trades either way that you do it. So the Assassin clearing the Bone Collector is exactly the same trade in the end. No mobility picked up either off the first draw, which means land couldn't be developed to clear out the 12-12 with the Assassin on board. Assassin might just take its value here on the Bone Collector, maybe position it in the center. Tiki Caretaker's pretty nice here because it helps the Fnatic clear the Bone Collector and you can still put the Assassin in a position where it threatens the 12-12 Soul Eater. 
So Bone Collector is going to come down and, and Caretaker to buff the Fanatic then. And Mr. T is going to try to play this as slow as possible. Going to throw creatures in front of the Assassin on the right and have his Assassin in range of the Soul Eater on the left. Try to play it out as slow as he possibly can. And sandwich that uh, Bone Collector in the middle to make sure it gets a power up. And doesn't even go for the collection on the left hand side, so really values, you know, the Soul Eater moving close to the Bone Collector if he wants to kill it, and then getting in range of that Assassin. But we do see a Wind Soldier coming up here, and the double neutral coming across. Wind Soldier gonna zip past, hit that Assassin, and I'm probably gonna see 13 damage, to, 14 damage to face. Maybe kills a Bone Collector. I would say face here. Yeah, I don't think there's any way you don't go face here. Uh, bone Collectors are not going to get big enough to really contest your Soul Eater. Uh, even the Caretaker on the, the right side, it buffs the 3-5 up to 4. If you're somehow able to maneuver your Bone Collectors in the right way, maybe the other one gets up to 4 as well. Your Soul Eater still would have been very healthy, but Lou going for the uh, more sure play of just denying any shenanigans from Mr. T and clearing off that Bone Collector. Yeah, potentially just denying a last nightmare, a good last nightmare here. If you hit for 14, it, it's not it's not great because if it gets nightmared, you didn't get to clear a Bone Collector and those Bone Collectors are gonna grow. So I think if Mr. T didn't fall onto like six Sphere exactly, Lou might have taken a more aggressive line. So say he was uh, top, de top deck in Fairy, you could say, you know, Fairy is starved. But then again, he could still collect two sides plus one nightmare. So. Yeah, I don't actually mind taking the clear there. Uh, it just played around that nightmare. Yeah, in that situation, you're just looking at playing around absolutely everything possible. Uh, and that's really what the line that Lou went for was. And gonna try to pump out as, as many creatures as possible. And there is enough power on board to clear out the Soul Eater before it is the, the one turn kill, but Ooh, now with the Fnatic picked up, I wonder if Lou starts to kite away. Get that hit in, and then Fnatic even just off to the right a little bit, uh, onto the well spot. Could even Fnatic the Demon Wing to kill the other Demon Wing, and then just hit the orb? And that just takes 5 power away from uh, being able to clear the Soul Eater, but also pushes the Soul Eater to a 13 life range, so even pushing it further out of reach of what's already available on board. So... Actually, I wouldn't mind the Fnatic line here if you plan to hit all, but I think Lou might actually just go for another Bone Collector clear and play around the Last Nightmare again. Uh, Lou would actually be able to use the Demon Wrangler as well and get this Soul Eater to 17. And then you're looking at possibly a Wind Soldier being lethal, but I believe he's used all three now. He used two down the right side to clear the early Soul Eater from Mr. T and one to clear the Assassin that was in the middle. So it's not like you're looking at... Uh, potentially that you know wind soldier finding you the, the final lethal there but at least does go for clearing the demon wing the demon wing like you were talking about and now there just isn't enough power for mr t to clear the soul eater interesting because he he hit he cleared the bone collector the first time i imagine a player around nightmare but the second time he went in for the orb damage so kind of just changed up a strategy trying to finish the game off soon is there a way to clear this seven Seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, 11. I think it's, is it one short? Two short. Oh, wouldn't have got the extra buff from the Bone Collector from the uh, the Wrangler die, dying there. But almost coming out from Mr. T, almost able to clear. And now we hear the music. Lou getting the extra buffs from the next Soul Eater. It would not have mattered even if this one died because the next one would be uncontested. But that is going to be game one over to Lou. And the sack mirror comes to its end. Uh, being first player, very relevant there. You know, being able to get that Soul Eater down first, being able to react to the Assassin and set up his own Assassin in a way where it could challenge other Soul Eaters. The Double Wind Soldier there was actually huge because it took care of Miss, Mr. T's biggest asset, which was his Soul Eater, and it took care of it so cleanly as well. It was... It was it just lined up perfectly, and then Lou had that massive powerhouse to just keep either push clearing creatures or pushing damage. Yeah, played it, you know, extremely carefully in a lot of situations. A lot of turns there, Lou just went for, you know, the right clear in the right way, the Soul Eater opposite side of the board, uh, just playing 
really around every single out that he could think of. So we're looking at Red <laughs> Rush, I would say. That is an awful hand. Uh, but, you know, uh, Imperial Drain is, is pretty good uh, against a, a deck that really wants to harvest, harvest as much fear as possible, like Green Yellow Sacrifice. It's quite slow in nature, quite defensive. I know collecting off your own wells is really important, but Mr. T will want to find some form of creature in the next two turns. Yeah, you definitely want a creature as fast as possible. Um, I would guess that we'd probably see something like a Mace Man in, uh, in this deck, and because that allows you to extend your neutrals as quick as possible. I'm actually surprised that he doesn't go for a Mountain there. I was but... just about to say, yeah, Mountain Mountain Ground Shaker looked really nice. Mountain Mountain Ground Shaker and having the Ground Shaker Cypher's Wrath would clear absolutely anything that Lou plays, I believe. So you would have lined up really nicely depending on what the follow-up was. Maybe he's not really concerned about the the first creature that Lou plays because he has that Imperial Drain, and he's really just concerned about getting that as close as possible to the orb once those creatures do come down. I think one thing that's important to point out about Lou's hand is it's pretty nuts when defending against Rush because he gets to play his first Skyak of this turn, the next turn go into another desert and then just smile into the other Skyaks. And this could be very valuable when defending against Rush. Now, Red does have access to the area of effect removal like Firestorm and Garadan, but Rush decks don't tend to run them because they're a little slow. They demand more mountains than Red Rush wants to develop. Yeah, and generally it requires that extra bit of fairy as well. Red Rush, uh, you know, historically loves to sit right around that four, five uh, type of spot. You want to get control of one well so that you have at least that little bit of fairy income every single turn, and then you're able to, you know, accelerate from there of your four and five cost uh, creatures or smaller events. It doesn't really like to push past that spot. Ground Shaker generally the highest. So you generally don't see things like the Firestorm, which is six, or even something like uh, like a Hellfire to finish the game at seven. And we see Lou going for the similar strategy he went for in a previous game, where he's trying to dictate where the lands go. You know, he's, he's pushing them off to one side so he can defend from the other side and make sure he can collect that Faria. However, now Shaitan Assassin should be pretty good, uh, depending on what Mr. T had. Of course, we can see Mr. T has a really good answer to it in the Ground Shaker Cypher's Wrath, but if this lines up right with the Smiles bringing another Skyak, this should be Assassin to sacrifice the first one, and then uh, Skyak right in behind. And he can actually Skyak on the mountain and another mountain spot, so we can make a read of where, where would the next mountain want to come down. Uh, and he's going to go on the Axe Grinder spot, so nice play there from Lou, just negating that Axe Grinder spot, and Mr. T draws the Axe Grinder. Yeah, really, uh, really heads up from Lou there. Now, really good answer from Mr. T here with the Ground Shaker that'll pop the protection from the Shaitan Assassin and the Double Cypher's Wrath to follow up if he chooses to go for both. I think you would go for both just because otherwise both of these Sky Axe would kill the Ground Shaker. And Lua, you know, Faria Star, because of this Imperial Drain, the Demon Wrangler is not a bad pickup here. It sets up an additional Collector, also sets up an additional Threat, but you really want to find those additional Sky Axe for the follow-up. But Iona's Smile could pull other cards. It could just pull two Soul Eaters, or it could pull two Flash Salmons, but he does find it. So uh, ignore everything I said. And the plus one into the <laughs> Demon Wrangler, quite slow for a uh, Green Arrow Sack player, especially when they want to be developing lands, and does actually give up the Mountain Spot on the right-hand side. Yeah, it, it is actually really slow in terms of your land development, but it does... Oh. I don't... Is it just going to be Axe Grinder in... It's going to just be Axe Grinder in between so that the Ground Shaker is a little more protected. I was like, why is he going for the plus one when you could step over and get the Axe Grinder on the, the buff spot? Um, but this just defends your Ground Shaker super nicely. Uh, definitely anticipating that Lou was going to hit with the Demon Wing and have that Flash Salmon to follow up to clear the Ground Shaker. Great presence of mind from the, from Mr. T. Just playing around the outs. I guess, like, another Flash Salmon here does kind of fix the problem because the Flash Salmon and the, uh, and the Demon Wrangler is enough to clear the Axe Grinder and then the Flash Salmon plus the Demon Wing. 
It's gonna clear the grind trigger. I, I, I think I still would still would have went for the axe grinder on the wells because you would have had gift of steel for that axe grinder, and it's a, a little, a little more conservative. But I think Mr. T was just playing for a win on that turn. Yeah, and now everything is kind of in Mr. T's wheelhouse. He's going to be able to reinforce. Now Maceman picked up is a perfect answer on an open board. Uh, Lou is going to be so far away from his win condition of the Soul Eaters, but the Skyak is going to produce four here. So it really does depend on getting your you know next set of creatures down and clearing off Mr. T's uh, aggression before you just outright die. The nice thing about the Sky Axe here, it also develops Faria Collectors and can block a mountain spot. I think it's very important, but now Lou is just a flame burst away from losing this match. And one of the things Red Rush is very good at doing, just putting you in that flame burst range and then they just keep drawing cards until they find their win condition and finish you off. Yeah, Mr. T right now is kind of sitting with all the time in the world. Now that really is only maybe the next two turns. If this Mace Man gets cleared and Mr. T isn't able to end the game within the next two turns where Lou is then going to be able to get to his Soul Eaters, then maybe you have an issue because the Soul Eaters are possibly going to represent enough to finish the game. But there it is, Gift of Steel picked up and Mr. T in very nice fashion, Red Rush as the counter here in game number two to lose Green Yellow Sack. So Red Rush, like you said uh, earlier in the broadcast, has been picking up in popularity on the ladder. Uh, rush decks just punishing kind of greedy land decks, be it Yellow Rush, Red Rush, or Green Rush. Uh, but against Green Elf Sacrifice, Red Rush has a really good time because the Grand Shakers line up really nicely with the One Life stuff. You have uh, great ways to combo that into a Cypher's Wrath or another Grand Shake if you want to kill Assassins, which are big threats. And unlike Yellow Rush, Yellow Rush has a lot of weenie little guys that poke away at you and then develop a big creature, whereas Red Rush just develops big threats. You know, high attack, reasonable life total threats, and uh, it's a little harder for Yellow Rush to take care of that compared to, um, sorry, Green Nail Sap to take care of that, whereas Yellow Rush is a lot easier for them. Yeah, another thing uh, it's actually a really big one in Red Rush is the Imperial Drain. You know, stopping your opponent from collecting. We saw a few times there that Lou had to go for the plus one Faria from the Power Wheel instead of developing his lands and continuing to work towards those Soul Leaders. Whereas something like Yellow Rush doesn't want to run that because they actually want their haste creatures to pick up the Faria for themselves. So yeah, very, uh, very important card in the Drain coming out in that last game there. Yeah, and Drain is also fantastic with the Queen's Guard and the Brigand because the combat ability generates the Feria that the Red Rush would miss from collecting, say, off an opponent's well. They don't need that well spot as badly as, say, uh, other decks, especially Green Rush, who definitely want that well spot to collect Feria as they're pushing damage. And Queen's Guard is just so good here, you know, just setting it up straight away, going to start getting value, going to be able to push orb damage next turn. Uh, he, he looks a bit hesitant, but I just go for it. Summon that mountain next turn, get free damage, get a bit of Faria, line up that Grand Shaker for later. Yeah, it's another uh, big thing in Red Rush is that it runs some of these neutral creatures. Uh, Queen's Guard fits really nicely because you have things like the Gift of Steel that you're just naturally running in that deck anyway. Picks up not only the combat or the uh, attack and defense of the combat value as well as that fairy gain like you were discussing there. Uh, also allows you to do exactly this. Queen's Guard right in front of the orb thanks to the uh, neutral uh, prairie extension. Yeah, now for Lou, he you know, has a lot of fairy to work with. Has the, the Brute, has the Grim Guard. Uh, the Grim Guard could just get some time you know there's not going to be a gift of steel coming down uh, but could go for same i mean i mean i think a better line here is probably just brigand grimguard a bit more conservative you know setting up two collectors forcing mr t to make decisions and does he go to the orb or does he start clearing it off the brigand which is going to help the grimguard take care of it next turn with the cypher's wrath yeah, and, and this is just trying to ensure that you have creatures down there. Again, is that Imperial Drain. Uh, also a little awkward for Mr. T because of the way his lands line up. He has that Axe Grinder. You could go Mountain and play the Axe Grinder. But in order to contest either of these creatures coming out from Lou, you have to step onto the Mountain that you're going to create. So there's not going to be any creature follow-up from Mr. T. Possibly could be a good thing because that could mean Ground Shaker could be important next turn. 
yeah, Ground Shaker could line up really nicely, and we're actually going to see a way for Lou to challenge this Queen's Guard, but it's going to gain an extra Feria from the Combat ability. And, it, you know, Imperial Drain is going to be nice because not only does it lock out the well on the right, but the positioning also means that the Brigand isn't going to get any value. Yeah, and the Imperial Drain, pretty big again. Uh, you know, we've been discussing it quite a bit throughout these two matches. Lou, one Faria short because the Brigand doesn't collect, of possibly having gone for, like, the Shed and Brute as a follow-up instead of going for... Uh, the, the Cypher's Wrath there. Generally, you probably want to play the Wrath just to clear off the creature anyway before any kind of Gift of Steel shenanigans come down, but, you know, that that was burn damage instead of uh, combat as well. If it was, you know, Mr. T had gone to the right and contested this Brigand, then Lou maybe would have had the Feria to recover, uh, play the Brute in behind. Yeah, and that was Mr. T basically just respecting Brigand's ability to generate resources for Lou. Like, he... He wants to leverage Lou's Fairy gain as much as possible using the Imperial Drain. And now we see the Axe Grinder coming in between his own Brigand to make sure that this Brigand hopefully doesn't find a Gift of Steel and maybe has to just trade away and then his Brigand can generate additional Fairy by hitting the orb. Kaleem's training will be that extra one damage that allows the uh, clear onto the Axe Grinder here, but essentially a wasted card. A lot of times you want to use that training to get a lot more value than uh, was just achieved there. So now I can gain those additional Faria. Opens up a card draw if it's desired. I Do you plus one instead? No, I guess by the combat of the brigand you'll still get to ground shaker next turn so draw does make more sense i was going to say possibly plus one allows you to plus one and then ground shaker and cypher's wrath next turn but that's not a guarantee that you'll draw that uh sequence and the awkward thing for lou right now is he wants to collect fairy he wants to gain resources but ideally you want to kill the brigand before it hits the orb again and then has to be answered so yeah taking care of the brigand now because if he if he leaves up for another turn there is potential for it to gain an additional two Faria once it get cl once it cleared on the follow up, and another Imperial Drain just locking out Lou's Faria, making it very difficult for him to respond. I actually wonder if this is a position where you take a little bit more passive line, where you step the Ground Shaker over to collect, and then plus one Ground Shaker Cipher's Wrath to kill the three three brute, and oh, then like play that. the Drain afterwards. Uh, but going to go for the more aggressive, just hit the orb, play a second ground shaker, and of course that Imperial Drain again. I actually really like that line uh, because it puts ground shaker in the position to attack the orb next turn as well, but also takes away one of the answers. I mean, one ground shaker is going to die here, but... Oh no, it's not. It's just going to gonna block off and just wait. So I guess this actually does set up the double clear next turn. It also stops Mr. T from attacking with both creatures. Uh, do you clear Captain instead of the Brute? I think... I think you make land, clear the Brute on the right, and then Cypher's Wrath, the Brute on the left, and push five damage. Uh, you push 7 damage that way uh, with the combination of a Ground Shaker hit and the Cypher's Wrath. Both brutes get eliminated, one of them doesn't get combat damage. And yeah, and it's just little Cap 10 on his own dealing with two Ground Shakers. I, I was going to say I possibly like stepping and playing the Brigand. I think there was a big debate that you could have there of developing the lands and going for the clear like you were discussing, or playing the Brigand uh, like this. It's just so tough in this situation because I, I, Captain can now attack the Brigand and then you're able to Gift of Steel so that the Brute can kill off the Ground Shaker and then the other Ground Shaker actually isn't able to hit the Orb next on the next turn here. So This is why yeah, I, I like clearing both Brutes because then, the ground, yeah. then you can't uh, develop a Gift of Steel to play on Captain because he gains it after he's hit. So it makes it much more awkward. Uh, but to be fair, I still think Mr. T is in a really good position simply because four life is not a lot when playing against a red player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that those flame bursts are eventually going to come out. 
Um, I think another thing of the step over to clear the brutes that Mr. T could have gone for is that actually set your ground shaker that would survive. If you're assuming one of them is going to die, the one that would survive would have been on kind of a corner angle and it would have had two attack alleys instead of this type of setup where your ground shaker here only has this one attack angle which is now blocked by cap 10. Um, uh, again there's that first flame burst picked up another flame burst even ground shaker uh, I wouldn't expect kind of single damage pings to come out in, in ways of something like a derelict tower or even a flame spitter, but even just going with the mace man as the reinforcement should still give you a creature that survives up till next turn. I'm curious if it's worth, I mean, I guess it plays in the flame burst. I was thinking you could step onto the mountain, clear the cap 10 and then flame burst the brute, just try and set up lethal, but I don't know. It doesn't, I don't think it really lines up. Oh, I, I don't know about that. I think you either, I mean, I think you step because it guarantees that you can hit the orb next turn and nothing be block can block you. But Lou now has to react with a flame burst, but that still lets Mr. T play Mace Man onto an empty board. So it, it kind of works out regardless. Yeah, I think it was essentially the same, whether you went for an extra creature there or went for the clear. If you went for the creature, then the brute would clear that creature and the flame burst would clear ground shaker or the flame burst kills ground shaker and then you play the creature on the follow-up so I, th I think it works exactly the same way whichever way you did it uh the one way just saved the flame burst for possible uh extra burst to win the game so the problem now is it's going to be very hard for lou to kill a five six <laughs> on full theory it's just not going to happen unfortunately Yeah, even with something like a, a Grimguard, uh, you're only delaying for one turn. It's not going to be enough. And we go see the, the Flash Wind to move away, but that's still within range. And Mr. T going to take the second straight game with the Red Rush here. Yep, and that is 2-1. Red Rush making its return in this monthly cup. And I wonder how Lou feels right now, because I feel that Mr. T... Although, you know, he wants to win and he wants, you know, become a monthly cup champion, I don't think he has no expectation built around him, right? You know, he any any placement that Mr. T gets today is going to be fantastic for him because it's progress. He went from a round one out to a top four placement, which is huge. But for Lou, you know, he's been trying to win a monthly cup for so long now. I can man I can imagine it could cause a little bit of stress. Yeah, I definitely think that it is uh, something where Lou could, you know, start feeling that little bit of sweat, a little bit of the nerves getting to him here. Uh, I, I mean, he's such a top player that you generally wouldn't expect that to affect him. But after this many months where it's the same over and over, I wonder if it is. I mean, he's only human at the end of the day, and, you know, pressure can build up, especially when expectations built around you. In in these kind of semi-finals, uh, across all games, really, the player who's unknown usually has an, <laughs> a much easier time when he's ahead because the player who has, expect who's, has expectations built around him can get a lot of pressure. Yeah, I think you can also uh, kind of put a case for that you would have information on your opponent of course because lou is such a big name in feria has been in so many monthly cups maybe if you've watched monthly cups before actually playing in the competitive side you maybe have that information on how they play um you know what they're they like to uh, bring as their lineups but i was actually looking back through my notes uh, on our break a little earlier and lou has played different lineups in each of the past four months brought different starting decks brought something different each month and still put up these uh, consistent performances so i mean even that isn't a big you know uh talking point that you can go for where you just know what your opponent's playing it's just lou always brings something different yeah lou lou is a talented enough player that he can pretty much pilot anything he puts a little bit of time into because he has so much experience with this game and so much ability that uh, he can just ride off that. And he can build lineups to counter what he believes the meta is, or he can build lineups where he feels uh, the decks are strong. And that's uh, that's just a testament of his ability and how good of a player he is. 
Whereas, we know uh, less experienced players might just lean towards meta decks, which, is a, which has been a little bit more difficult this monthly cup because we don't really have an established meta yet. So it's kind of a free-for-all in that respect. Yeah, it definitely makes things a little more complicated when you're unsure of what's coming. Uh, Mr. T going for this really aggressive line. I was actually wondering if he would go for this or if he would go for something like the double neutrals and actually clear the Living Willow last turn. Um, but goes for pushing damage as quick as possible. Frog Tosser is going to clear at least one of the Mace Men here, but you know, Mr. T is looking like he's set up really nicely. Get that Axe Grinder position and uh, kind of have the, the early tempo here. I think one main thing that's going to be different in this match currently is the lack of Imperial Drain. Because Blue Green Rant needs Feria. They need to be able to play enough Feria to play these Sky Whales, which are quite expensive. And if that Water Elemental on the left hand side gets to double collect every turn, that's probably going to be enough Feria for Lou to continue to fend off uh, Mr. T here with Sky Whales. With a, a Farian Golem is going to be a big one as well. Like Farian Golem as a 510, how does Red Rush deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's something that Red has always struggled with, is uh, dealing with these big, especially big green creatures. Um, it, this type of situation, yeah, like you were talking about with the drain, green-blue ramp does this really nicely. They get in between the wells, they double collect, and then they just outvalue you from there. But not having the drain, it would be a big swing. Although, you know, possibly the water elemental could just jump across and actually clear it, so... That was a mistake. Uh, Interesting. A bit of mind games coming out from Lou. He's, <laughs> now, Lou is known to, to use his emotes wisely, you could say. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, maybe he's just trying to make Mr. T second guess his moves with some emotes. And to be fair, he, he, he he's taking any advantage he can gain here. And I feel that actually Lou's in a pretty good spot. You know, he didn't Cypher's Wrath the Frog. So now Elderwood on the Frog can... Uh, well, Elderwood on the... Water I Elemental you... It's pretty strong here to clear out. I, th I think I like Sky Whale on the Queen's Guard, and then you still embrace the frog. It clears the Axe Grinder, because that and actually allows free you free. to jump across and collect. And the free but free, yeah, free is a Mace Man. I'm very surprised that the Cypher's Wrath didn't come down to clear the frog there. But maybe was trying to save it for, you know, something better. It, it still in this position clears the frog, but now you've just lost so much tempo, I think. I, I think it's going to be very difficult now for Mr. T to come back, simply because the frog is still alive, it's still going to collect. Cypher's Wrath can come down, maybe just play a brigand on the whale spot, force the whale to take a bit of damage, but, you know, the, the whales are 6-6. Six, six. Not that easy to clear without a Grand Shaker where things line up quite perfectly, but Lou, on 10 life, maybe he's going to try and leverage some combat damage and take those flame bursts for the win. The Sky Whale goes aggressive, plus one second Sky Whale Lou going for the win right now. Just going to ignore the aggression of the Grimguard. Yep, Sky Whale probably going to seal this game now. Uh, Mr. T is not going to have any momentum remaining. Dear an adventurer, not the card you want to see in this situation. Free Feria, not really anything relevant to play. Sky Whales might be enough here to seal the game for Lou. And... No, Lou can't really die to, like, Brigand Double Flame Burst now, and can just go in for 12. I, I think you draw initially, because if you draw Elderwood Embrace, you just win right now. Maybe he's just going for the Fugu instead, because that guarantees it. Another strong creature. You could have actually cleared the Brigand there if you wanted to, but... Very Flame quick Burst response. Up, oh, yeah, it's Flame almost picked up was almost lethal for Mr. T. Because he gained the extra area that he needed to be able to double flame burst here. This is actually still incredibly close. If Lou didn't have the second Sky Whale and had to attack into the Grim Guard, it would have dealt the extra two damage that Mr. T needed. Just a bit short. And, Lou and we've seen this knowing. actually a couple times today through the burn that it's been just that little bit of extra damage off. Yeah, it's like I said, the second Sky Whale obviously playing a big role there in Lou's victory, but Lou also understanding that there's just no way that 
Mr. D can win that match. Regardless if he goes face or if he kills the brigand, he just doesn't have enough area to generate enough damage. He would have needed triple flame burst or double flame burst gift of steel in that in that spot. And that would have been nine fairy in total. And you know, drawing cards is a resource as well. He couldn't leverage at that point. So two two. Lou coming back with a bit of a bit of uh, mind games of the emotes. Maybe that threw uh, Mr. TR from using that Cypher's Wrath. <laughs> Quite possibly. Uh, it could be something where it starts to get in your head, especially when we, you know, we were talking about the veteran versus uh, the newer face in the competitive scene. When you're saying that, that was a mistake. It's, okay, is he just trolling me? Did I actually make a mistake? What's going on? Lou would uh, know if I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, blue jump coming up from Mr. T is his final jet deck. Interesting to see this uh, kind of make the resurgence here. See, I, I'm from what we've seen of blue jump so far, I'm not sure if it's good enough. Because... I don't know, it, it didn't have a strong showing for Mayhem, it, it kind of got blown out by Green Yellow Sack, but I think that's a bad matchup. Is Blue Green Ramp going to be a better matchup for Blue Jump? I'm, I'm not too sure. Yeah, quite possibly could be. Uh, you have your Triton Warriors early on, at least trade with Frog Tossers if that's something that comes out. It also allows you to chase around the Water Elementals, uh, get at the Wood Elementals if they're the early creatures coming out. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how it fares in this, if it's going to be better than when we saw it earlier. But I'm actually surprised that Mr. T is moving away instead of uh, contesting Lou. Yeah, I, I think you go down the same side here because the Triton Warriors are just two hit kills on the Willows. And it means he gets no feed value from it as well, which is very important. And, you know, he's, he's kind of letting Lou go into the wells here and, the, you know, the lake on the, on the right-hand side is not gearing towards moving to the left-hand side. So uh, unless he's just thinking, you know what, I'll just double collect off the right uncontested, get a very early Colossus down, and then you're gonna have to deal with it. And there we do see the Feed the Forest. Uh, another forest short, however, so not able to ramp up the, the Feria this turn, but Lou gonna, looks like continue to make forests. You're still really looking for the extra elementals. You can continue to ramp as quick as possible. Everything right now just looks, you know, so nice for Mr. T. He can control up the right side. I wonder how aggressive he chooses to be. So how would you how would you go about it? I guess Lake here is fine because you get to double collect there. Uh, Triton Warrior can also move across, pass the turn, take maybe double neutral, and then go for four damage on the follow up, and then you would have collected off the opponent's well three times, and you might feel more comfortable about playing a Colossus then. Yeah, in that type of a situation, you, you almost look at it and go, can you just basically go for what would be all in? Uh, Triton Warrior going to attack the orb, possibly for six if he chooses to use the Aurora, and then you Colossus in behind. You're then looking at like Mirror Phantasm buffs the Aurora on the turn after. Like it's it really snowballs into a point of do you want to go for like an all in uh, type of play or do you go for the the slower more conservative style of clearing whatever your opponent plays here. The Wood Elemental is interesting position-wise because it just dies to the Triton Warrior. Uh, I don't know if this is a little bait. I, I guess actually the, lake, the defensive lake makes it more difficult for that to happen. I don't think it can happen now uh, without... Yeah, it, it just can't happen. So the defensive lake stopped that altogether. But this is a perfect opportunity now for the Wave Crash Colossus to come down. Not I, I really I really like Aurora and Emperor's Command, the Living Willow, and then Mirror Phantasm Aurora, but you're one fairy short of it. Oof, yeah, that would have been pretty nice. Because I don't I don't want to see Aurora come down by itself. Especially when you're looking at your opponent being in a situation where they can frog toss her next turn and clear Aurora. That looks really difficult to me. So this is very nice aggress aggression set up by Mr. T, but some of this value can be recovered now because the Frog Tosser can come down and hit Aurora. That 4-3 can come down in a decent enough defensive position, and you get the Frog down in the bottom right corner, which should allow you some Feria collection or just maybe an aggressive spot for your eventual Sky Whale or uh, Fugu. I just I don't like seeing the Aurora be that 
uh, you know, vulnerable as the one one left by itself. I guess another concern here as well is the farrier that was used in that turn, and there was a lot of farrier, doesn't set up an, a, a mirror phantasm on this uh, firing golem now. So it's, like, it's a little awkward, really, actually, because MP would just be so good here. MP the you could MP the farrier, take care of it with the colossus, clear out the wood elemental. And then you could clear out the frog toss, and then you'd have this aggressive colossus pushing on the next turn. But Lou has such a great response there, developed a lot of creatures to defend, but also getting that aggressive frog that can collect off his opponents well and potentially set up some aggressive lands. Oh, the well played! <laughs> the oh, well Lou. played coming out from Lou. I think it's more feisty the like the the, the longer the tournament goes on. <laughs> <laughs> I think in this situation as well, because you're feeling that momentum. This was Lou won game number one, he then lost game two and three, and then you start to feel like it's swinging back in your favor. You start to control game four, then you win game four, and now you're controlling game five. And the, uh, you know, that, what we call the, the BM emotes coming out, you really start to just feel the momentum of the game. What is happening here? He moved... I don't know if I agree with this because he just moved the Colossus in range of the Frog Tosser. It's very Yeah, it definitely could have been a, a situation where you protect that a little more. Oh, Lou actually going for the draw instead of developing the land that would have allowed him to Sky Whale the uh, Triton Warrior and really seal the game. He's now one short of being able to play the Wood Elemental as well. And a situation where he could have yeah, you know, possibly done a little better. I think he just went for the instant draw before he even saw the card that he drew, which was the Sky Whale, but Mr. T oh, wow. kind of sees the writing on the wall and just surrenders Lou with the comeback in the series, winning game four and five to punch his ticket into another Grand Finals. I call that overconfidence, BM. <laughs> he just didn't even... I'm, I'm going to win this. <laughs> I don't care. Just going to draw a card. I don't, don't need to play Sky Whale. Sky will make things easy for me. Let's have a challenge. So yeah, overconfidence, PM, right there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that Lou, you know, securing that grand final spot. I think that's very important for him right now. You know, this could be his time to shine. I think, like, I actually, in a way, I don't think either result is bad for Lou because if he wins, it's amazing. But if he loses, he just becomes like he just cements his status as the number two guy. <laughs> but I, I don't necessarily think that's that's bad anymore because it's quite it's actually very impressive to get second place so many times you know it just yeah. just be so short of it I, I, obviously winning is the better is the best of the both but I, I don't think the number two is that bad either no it definitely is uh, kind of a show of consistency to at least always make it to at least the semi-final stage and then more often than not make it into the grand finals win or lose in that situation it almost doesn't matter just because of the consistency level of getting to the grand finals so many times and what's more impressive about that consistency is also the fact that lou brings different lineups every time you know, he doesn't yeah. stick to the same lineup. He, he brings completely different decks and just going to show like how skillful he is as a pilot of kind of any deck or archetype in this game. Yeah, it's it's really incredible every single time. Uh, you know, we see him go through all these different changes. We saw uh, the one monthly cup, he brought Green Rush as his opener and really just you know, stormed through the competition with that. Uh, of course, the green blue ramp has been very consistent uh, th since Oversky was released, but that's kind of been something that uh, has had its own spin on it, thanks to Lou running the Theory Golems. I think he was the first one that we really saw run that, at least on the the competitive scene. I think now because you, we have to go to five forests to get Feed the Forest, you might as well run Firing Golem as well, because not only is it a fantastic feed target, but it's also a great aggressive or defensive creature because of its stats. So Firing Golem, you know, finding a home now in these ramp decks just because Green Blue-Green uh, blue, Ramp still wants Feed the Forest. It's still an amazing economy card, and you're still going to run Living Willow with it. So it kind of, even though the nerf slowed the card down, it didn't completely cripple the archetype. They can still make use of it. Uh, it's just a little slower. 
Yeah, there definitely, you know, could be other ways that you run it, but cutting that package just seems so inefficient when, you know, having your willow feed is sometimes your only way back into the game. So definitely seems like uh, an incredibly strong, and I shouldn't even say seems like it is, uh, Lou, really showing that it is an incredibly strong style to still play. I mean, um, to be fair, like, I feel, I did try the Ancient Herald version, because I, I felt like the Mystic Beast change is really cool and the kind of some synergy of yep. Ancient Herald. Uh, but it doesn't match the, the ramp power that Feed the Forest still offers in terms of economy. You know, it, it's yeah. still a better economy card. And I, I think uh, Blue Green Rant still wants to go down the more control style of deck where you just get lands out, you sit back, you wait for your win condition. I think it wants that more. Uh, than say more than a kind of a more tempo mid range orientated build which uses ancient heralds and mystic beasts. So I I, I think the, the it's still correct to go for feed the forest, but it was just kind of a I think like the tier one decks of our last balance of our last patch all had a kind of a, a nerf to them just to tone them down. Yeah. Yellow tempo had the flash wind and the charger changed. Red combat had the underground boss change as well you know bring that life total down and then blue green ramp had the feed the forest change but it looks like blue green ramp is the only deck that survived it you know we haven't <laughs> seen any yellow tempo but i think that's because yellow rush is just a bit stronger right now and red combat who knows right like, where does that where does that deck go is red red yellow burn stronger or, or, yeah it almost I almost know. seems like the the red burn has really taken that uh position yeah we i think we have do we have the results of the other yep. match? Oh my goodness. So things are being switched up here. The expectations we may have had, you know, maybe the veteran, both the veterans going through and having that, you know, El Clasico playoff for the finals there. But no, it's actually going to be Masaka versus Lu90 in the grand finals representative from Japan. We had a South Korea win the last monthly cup. So maybe this is Japan's time to shine at the end of the year, showing they're a force to be reckoned with. And then we have Alva and Mr. T in the the, the mirror match below uh, to fellow countrymen battling out for the third place prize. Yeah, we have some really interesting matches coming up uh, in in the finals here. And we haven't seen much of Masak. We haven't seen any of Masak on the stream, so it's going to be really nice to see him play in the final. So we're going to go into a break and set up those matches for you guys. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back soon with the third place match.